two board members this evening, Mary Ellen and James. Any announcements before we begin the presentation? Yes, uh, Mr. President, I have a few. Um, I recently toured the Bulletin's Potter Road Career and Technical Center in West Seneca, and I was, I was very impressed with some of the new programs. Um, include animal science, aviation technology, business management, marketing, criminal justice, engineering, robotics, forest science, wildlife and, and zoo and wildlife conservation. There also are programs for adults in the workforce development program. Uh, just a quick recap with the Erie County Association of School Boards legislative team. We've been meeting uh, usually on a monthly basis. We've been discussing the Run It and Fund It uh, initiative. Uh, the legislative team has declared that appropriate funding through foundation aid is the paramount objective considering the governor's proposed budget, which provides just a quarter, 25%, of the foundation aid deemed necessary just for a rollover budget for school districts, and which would wipe out funds still owed to districts under the existing formula. And finally, and I'm sure Jeff will mention this as well, we met on Friday with our new uh, state assemblyman, Mike Norris. Uh, we discussed our concerns regarding the upcoming state budget and heard his take on current issues in the state legislature. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. With that, I turn it over to the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Fuchs. Um, welcome, everyone, to our second budget study session. We have handouts down at the bottom. And we also have on our website all of the slides from the first and now the second budget study session plus the video of those. Going, we're going to have the second draft of our budget. We're going to give you um, great detail on how we have determined the tax levy cap information for Clarence, and also detail on our pr proposed bus purchase proposition. Um, this is usually the way we start our budget presentations. We have a philosophy. Um, first overall goal when we're cre creating the budget is to protect and enhance the core programs of the district. Uh, second goal is to be fiscally responsible with everyone's tax dollars. So, a little bit about our enrollment. Um, we have some graphs in here, but these are some summary kind of generalizations about enrollment for the next five years. Just so that everyone knows, we commission two studies annually to give us enrollment projections. They give us five and 10 year projections and they give us three different methodologies that those projections are calculated. What you'll see is the most conservative methodology projected in the graphs and charts. Um, and we think that these companies that we've been dealing with, they've been right on the past five or 10 years. So we have confidence that this is what's actually going to be enrollment trends for the Clarence District. So over the next five years, Elementary enrollment has stabilized. It had been going down. It's going to start to go back up. Uh, it will increase slightly over the next five years. The middle school enrollment, uh, which has been pretty stable for the past four or five years, will begin to decline. And it'll decline by 30 to 35 students per year for the next five years. The high school is the most difficult um, building to project, but we think the high school will also decline by 20 to 25 students for the next five years. Overall, uh, our district will decline 30 to 35 students for the next five years, but then it will begin to stabilize, and because of the increases at the elementary level, our district enrollment will plateau and probably go up a little bit. Our actual kindergarten number, and kindergarten is the grade level that we pay the closest attention to. Uh, because for the most part, students, when they move to Clarence, stay in Clarence. There's very little move in, move out over the course of a school year. But kindergarten, um, our actual enrollment has been higher than what our projections have been the past two years. We'll show you what our projections are for this year. And we think that we're going to be a little bit low. So here, here's the elementary enrollment. The, fir the blue graph is from the company called mid cities that we deal with and the red is from a company called decision insight 
So you can see that we will plateau and then in the next five years there will be an upward trend for elementary enrollment uh, staying over that 1800 student mark. This is the projections for the middle school and again elementary enrollment has been down the past five years as those kids cycle through the middle school the middle school will go from 1100 kids to about 930 940 kids over the next five years our high school will decline a little less rapidly than the middle school go from about 1500 kids where we are right now to about 1350 kids over the next five years this is our overall district enrollment. And again, um, a decline, but uh, a rather small decline over the next five years. One of the things that the Board of Education pays close attention to are class sizes in our elementary schools. We like to have class sizes at the primary level between 20 and 23 and class sizes at the intermediate level, which is grades three through five, between 22 and 24, 25 kids. Um, this is taking all of the students as they, as they actually, exi actually exi exist today and rolling them over to the next year. This does not account for kids who would move in and move out. Normally we have more move-ins than we do move out. For kindergarten, we've taken the actual census that we have in addition to the two projections from our companies, and we've done an average of those three methods. It's likely to be a little bit higher than what you see here for kindergarten. We will know specifically after each of the buildings at the <laughs> conduct their kindergarten roundups. And Clarence Center is first, and I believe, is Harris Hill last? So yes. Harris Hill's last. And by that time, we'll have very good numbers here. But as we project it right now, uh, Clarence Center is scheduled to pick up some additional kids next year. Ledgeview and Sheridan Hill, their kindergartens are a little bit lower than what they normally are. Harris Hill is a little bit higher than what it would normally be for kindergarten as well. You can see the class sizes as they project out with the sections and the number of teachers. We pay close attention to this and we'll move a teacher from one building to another if the class sizes don't balance or get too uh, or get get too large what we don't think we need to do is hire another elementary teacher at this point if these class sizes remain the same um, a little bit about the governor's budget we reviewed details about the governor's budget in our january meeting nothing has changed We met with our assemblyman, assemblyman Norris, who took over for Jane Corwin when she retired. And he was able to give us a little bit of information on the budget. Basically, the governor is uh, proposing a $1 billion increase to school aid. Uh, $428 million of it is in foundation aid. Out of that $428 million statewide, about $177,000 comes to Clarence. $330 million for expense-driven aids. Remember, expense-driven aids are things that uh, you expend one year and get the aid on the next year. Things like special education, transportation, BOCES, etc. Um, out of that 33 million, uh, we get uh, 15 or 20,000 additional dollars in expense-driven aids for next year. The governor has allocated 239 million for brand new programs. We're opposed to having that 239 million go to new programs before the governor fully funds foundation aid. In order for the governor to fully fund foundation aid as it, the formula currently exists, it would have to be $4 billion as an increase to state aid. Now, no one would think that a $4 billion increase would come in one year. But certainly, if there's a billion dollars to uh, allocate towards schools, fully uh, funding foundation aid before funding new programs would be something that we're in favor of. Uh, basically, another part of the governor's 
budget proposal, the executive budget proposal, is that he repeals the existing foundation aid formula. This formula has existed since 2007. Uh, it pushes dollars towards schools that are less wealthy, and it pushes dollars towards schools that have higher numbers of students in poverty and higher numbers of students who are uh, a special education or English language learners. If the foundation aid formula was to run as it's supposed to, Clarence would get another $900,000 in state aid. Uh, we're at a, a little under $200,000 for next year. Currently, the state law starts with a base, it updates the formula every year, and it works backward from a target. We think this is the proper way to fund school districts. What the governor is proposing is he would make the decision on how much foundation aid would, would increase year over year, and there would be no fixed target for anticipating future aid. This would give the governor more control of state aid. He already has a bunch of control over state aid. Usually, the legislature and the governor battle it out, and by the end of the budget session, some additional dollars are included. We think that the governor's proposal gives him much too much, too much power to set the formula for school aid. And that's not the governor's job. That's really the legislator's job, in our opinion. And we let uh, Assemblyman Norris know that. Just so that you can see a little bit of the difference. Most of the groups, the educational advocacy groups that are out there, including the Board of Regents, believe that the governor's budget needs to have at least $2 billion in expenditure increases for school districts in order for schools to roll their budgets over from one year to the next without any decreases. The governor's proposal, you can see, depending upon the need of your school district, and Clarence would be considered a low-need district in this particular chart. Uh, this is a per-pupil amount that the governor would be, that the governor's aid package was. If the governor's aid package was to include a full phase-in of foundation aid, this would be the per-pupil dollar numbers. And if it was to include a full phase-in of foundation aid without wi keeping the Save Harmless proposal, which is no district would get zero from one year to the next, it would be the white bars. So there's a pretty substantial difference between what the Board of Regents and what educational think tanks believe school districts need and what the governor is actually proposing. And this happens every year. The governor proposes a low number, the assembly and the Senate battle over another number, and then finally by April 1st, a number is settled on. We'd like that number to be settled before April 1st so that we can fully plan for our budget, but we'll take it whenever we can get it. Um, a couple of assumptions about our program before we get into the second draft of our budget. Our goals for 2718, no staff reductions, and maintain or improve all of our existing programs. The budget that you're about to see does not have any staff reductions in it. And we believe it maintains our programs, although it really doesn't improve upon any of our programs. The capped tax levy alone will not provide enough money to maintain existing programs. The school district will not go over the tax levy cap. So that makes us dependent on the state to give us the money that fills in the difference. The governor's budget does not provide enough state aid to balance the Clarence budget. Therefore, we will have to count on either a larger increase in state aid or we'll have to use our reserves and our fund balance to make up the difference in order to fund a budget that does not reduce staff and that maintains all of our existing programs. Now the good news is um, we've been very conservatively budgeting over the past couple of years and we have enough money in fund balance and reserves to make up the difference if the state doesn't give us any additional dollars, at least for this next year. There are two things that we closely monitor programmatically year over year. One is the number of special ed teachers that we need in order to fulfill all of the IEPs of our special education kids. And the second thing is, how many teachers do we need for English language learner students? 
our English language learner population has continued to increase. We currently have two and a half teachers that take care of our population of kids. We may end up needing three teachers because of the regulations and mandates from New York State. So if we were to add anything next year, it would likely be a ESL teacher, an English language learner teacher, or a special education teacher. If our programs, and we won't really know all of this until May or June time, if our programs um, show that particular need. All right, we're gonna give, this is usually the time of the budget presentation when we give you a little bit more detail on expenditures and revenues. So here are our, our assumptions on the revenue side of the budget. Uh, we are lucky to live in a county that shares sales tax revenue with school districts. Not every school district across the state has that. School districts in Erie County do have that. And we anticipate a sales, sales tax increase of about 2%. That's a good thing for us. Local revenues, what we collect from interest rates, miscellaneous sources, and for those commercial property owners who pay uh, payments in lieu of taxes, those are pilots, that's gonna remain flat. It's about $760,000 year over year. Our appropriated fund balance and our appropriated reserves will increase if state aid is low. And we'll review how when we take a look uh, in a couple of slides. Our tax levy cap estimate is 1.7%. It needs to be finalized for real on March 1st, we don't think it's gonna change. It stays at 1.7%. And with that 1.7%, we will be able to generate about $800,000 on the levy. New York School Aid, we anticipated it would increase by 3%. It has only increased by 1%. So right now our lobbying efforts with our legislators is we need more money from the state in order to balance our budget. This is a summary of all the revenues, the large revenues that we have. Property tax is a little over um, $46.7 million. Sales tax, about $5.4 million. Money that we earn on interest, about $80,000. Our local revenues, which includes payment of lieu of taxes and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the pilots are on the property tax line. Our local revenues, which are things like fees and other stuff about 628,000. State aid, about 28.4 million. So what that makes us is a district that counts on our local property taxpayers for about 70% of our budget and on the state for about 30% of our budget. We get $570,000 in what's called Medicaid assistance for those students who qualify for it. And we currently appropriate $1.2 million in fund balance every year from our surplus reserves um, as a revenue in the next year's budget. Now the green number is what we're lacking at this point to balance things. We're about $733,000 short. Now it would be great if we could get all of that from New York State. We probably won't. So we will backfill whatever we don't get from New York State with either increasing the appropriated fund balance line or we have a debt reserve that we can utilize as well. So our total spending year over year is a 2.6% increase. Our budget goes to 80 million, 80.2 million. Our estimated tax rate is $14.67 per thousand um, of assessed value. And we'll get into what this is in greater detail on, on the tax cap slides. So that's our revenue detail. Here's a little bit about our expenditure detail. Um, first, our wages for all of our employee groups are up about 3% overall. And salary and benefits account for about 75% of the school budget. Our retirement system costs are actually down this year by about $110,000. Uh, our special education costs have gone up about 2% as a projection. Our debt service is costed out per schedule and um, it's amortized and we're getting the amount of state aid that we should, including on our new capital project. Our healthcare expenses are up 
by about 5%. We have self-funded our health care for the past six years under the direction of Dr. Patak. And all of our employee groups contribute more to health care this year than they, have had in, than they have had in previous years. Our health care expenses are up 5%, but the overall regional average is 11%. So we're doing a pretty good job of managing that. All other costs in our budget, including utilities and equipment and supplies, are up about 1%. So some of these costs have been mitigated because we have engaged in efficiency measures through Mr. Mancuso's office, whether it be cooperative purchasing or other nifty things that Mr. Mancuso can figure out to save us money. Every year we give the community those cost drivers that are over $100,000 in increases. These are the cost drivers next year that are the major increases. They account for 95% of the increase in the budget. Instructional wages are teachers and administrators. It's a, 900, it's a little bit under a million dollars year over year. Non-instructional wages, about 283,000. Our healthcare increases, special education increases, and our increase that we spend at BOCES. So how does that figure all of that stuff into the tax levy cap? Well, this is a um, graphic of the formula that's utilized to determine the tax levy cap. Let me take it from this visual, which makes it look very complicated, to the easier to understand Mr. Mancuso method of figuring out the tax levy cap. Basically, you start with the levy that you have for this year, you add to it all of the adjustments that are necessary, you add to that the exemptions, you subtract that from last year's total, and you get a maximum tax levy limit for Clarence. The maximum tax levy limit for Clarence is $790,000 $164. That translates to a tax levy rate of 1.74%. Now this is where it sometimes get, gets confusing um, when we're talking about the difference between tax levy and tax rate. So I'm going to give you our little um, explanation of those two things. Tax levy is the amount of money that's raised via property taxes as a revenue in the school budget. The levy is determined by subtracting the total spending number in the budget from all other sources of revenue. Okay? So once you get rid of state aid, pilot payments in lieu of taxes, miscellaneous revenues, whatever's left is the tax levy for that particular year. The tax rate is the dollar per thousand number that's needed to raise the total tax levy in the four towns that make up the Clarence School District. The tax rate is determined by dividing the total assessed value of a town by the total tax levy to be raised. And it's listed as a per thousand dollar assessed value number on property tax owners. So what are some factors that in influence the levy and what are some factors that influence the rate? Well, factors that influence the levy, the number one factor is the tax cap calculation. In order to propose a budget to the community that needs only 50% approval, districts must stay within the tax cap limit. Our limit next year is 1.7%. So that is the biggest factor that influences the levy for us. We can't go over it. If we were to try to go over it, we would need 60% of our voters, 66% or 60% 60 of our voters say, to say yes. We are not going to try to go over the tax levy cap. Um, another factor that influences levy is the amount of state aid that our district receives. Our state aid this year is wholly inadequate and needs to go up. If we were to receive a whole bunch more state aid, we could use some of that money to reduce the tax levy like we've done over the past couple of years. Um, another factor that influences the levy is the amount of other revenues in the budget besides property taxes. And again, on the good side for us, we are anticipating a little bit more in sales tax. On the bad side, we're not getting nearly the amount of state aid that we need. 
So what are some factors that influence the rate, the per thousand number that determines your actual bill for property taxes? Well, the biggest factor that influences the rate is the total assessed value of property in a town. When assessments on property increase, the rate decreases. In the perfect world, if the total assessed value of all the properties in Clarence was equal from one year to the next, the tax rate increase would be equivalent to the tax levy increase, but it doesn't work that way. There's always reassessments on some properties when people sell their homes. Sometimes the town goes through a reassessment. Um, we don't believe the town is going through a reassessment this year, do we, Mr. Mancuso? Thank goodness. Usually they don't tell us if they're going to go through a reassessment, but we don't believe that they're going to do that this year. New property that's added to the assessment rolls, that has a big impact on rate. Um, and essentially, we're counting on at least a 1% increase in the total brand new property that gets put onto the tax rolls in Clarence when we give you this rate number. It's likely to be the number will be even lower than what we project it to be today. So these are the actual tax rate calculations. This shows you what did we say it was going to be in April with our budget, and then what was it when we actually set it in August? Because remember, we guess on the tax rate at this point because we don't have all of the information from the town assessor. We don't have the Clarence Town Assessor information. We don't have the Williamsville Town Assessor information, Newstead or Lancaster. Those are the part, portions of those town make up, make up the Clarence School District. But we can just use 2015-16 uh, as an example. In April, we said the tax rate was going to be $15.37 per thousand. But in August, when we actually said it, it was a full dollar less than that at $14.37 per thousand. Now the biggest reason for that was because there was more property that got added as new builds in the town of Clarence. Last year, we said it was gonna be $14.65 a thousand in April. When we actually said it, it was $14.53. As a matter of fact, every time since 2002, 2003, that we've given the public a number in April, the actual number when we said it has been lower. We're pretty confident that it's going to be lower than what we have today. But we show you this graph just for some historical perspective. So what does it mean on a real house? Well, we're anticipating the rate to be $14.67 per thousand. That's our estimate. On a house that's valued at $100,000, that would mean the tax increase for next year would be $14 annually or $1.17 a month. For a house that's valued at $200,000, the tax increase would be $28 or $2.33 per month. For a $300,000 house, the tax increase would be $42 or $3.50 a month. And we're very confident that these actual numbers will be lower, perhaps much lower, maybe even as low as half of what's on there by the time we get the total assessed valuation from our assessors. These are the lowest numbers that we've had in the past six years that we've been doing the budget and projecting the tax levy increase and the tax rate increase. So what are our assumptions for the second draft? Well, the first thing is we're going to have a tax levy cap of 1.7%. Second assumption, we're not going to have any budget reductions of any kind. Now, that also means we're not going to have any program enhancements of any kind. Um, there are areas in our program, uh, specifically music and the arts, that we, we need to enhance our programs, but we don't have enough money to do it next year. We had notice of five teacher retirements, and we built them into the budget. We were planning on seven, we got five, and we're making it balance. Our wages are anticipated to go up 3%. Our pension costs are down slightly. Our debt service runs according to schedule. All other expenses are up 1%. Healthcare, five. We're gonna use a combination of state aid, miscellaneous revenues, and reserves to stay within the tax cap for 2017, 2018. 
We're also recommending the purchase of buses, nine buses again this particular year. So our budget for this year is 78.1 million. Our budget for next year we're proposing is 80.2 million. We're getting 790,000 from the tax levy. That means we need 1.3 million from all other sources. We need about $730,000 to close our gap. If we get additional aid dollars, we will use it to close the gap. Um, we will spend less from our reserves and from our fund balance if we get additional state aid dollars. The budget in New York State is due on April 1st. It's been on time the last five years. We anticipate it's going to be on time this year. So before we finalize the budget at the Board of Education level, sorry about that, we will know. We would have to get an extremely large increase in order to consider restoring any teaching positions, and that is unlikely to happen. Okay. So that's it for our budget. Now, a little. this is usually where we give a little bit more detail on the bus proposition that will be out there. So there will be three things to vote on in May, on May 16th, when the budget vote happens. The first thing to vote on is the budget itself. The second thing to vote on is the bus proposition. open seats for our Board of Education. Thank you. A little bit of detail on our bus purchase. We would like to purchase five large 72 passenger buses next year, two wheelchair van buses, and two smaller 30 passenger buses. That's about an $820,000 expenditure. This keeps us on track of replacing our entire fleet in a 10 to 12 year time frame. We have about 100 buses. The tax cap influence is zero for the bus purchase. The tax um, levy uh, increase for the bus purchases is about $4 on a $200,000 home. Okay. So this gives you the last five years of what we've purchased in buses and in the next five years what we hope to purchase in buses. It shows you how many... We have 72 um, large capacity buses. We have a couple of large wheelchair buses. We don't buy large wheelchair buses anymore, but there's two left in our fleet. We have, uh, we, I'm sorry, we have 59 big buses, two large wheelchair buses, 18 30 passenger buses, 13 small wheelchair buses, and one uh, suburban that counts as a small capacity bus okay if we stay on track with these purchases we will have turned the fleet over on an 11 year average and we'll be in great shape and it's going to be very cost effective to do so this is what we've done for the past 11 years in bus purchases there were three years in the past 11 years where we did not purchase buses that puts us behind in our schedule At what point does the maintenance of a bus exceed its value? Well, in 9 to 11 years, our buses start to show superficial and structural deterioration that gets harder and harder for us to fix. Recently, we've had some 12-year-old buses that were pulled from service because there was cross motor deterioration, which was so bad that the bus couldn't pass inspection. The useful life of a bus engine and transmission is someplace between 110 and 140,000 miles. And do you know how many miles we drive per year, Rick, off the top of your head? Right about one million. Okay, so we drive about a million miles per year in our buses. We have done some things to maximize the um, efficiency of our fleet. We only buy high quality buses. We get the extended warranty on them. We have a really good maintenance program and the GPS service that we have on the buses, which tells the family what their bus is at any time, 
also tells us exactly what maintenance the bus needs at any given time. Rust inhibitor on it. But despite all of that, But we might know a little bit more about state aid at that point. Our regular board meetings are also listed on here. April 17th is when the Board of Education needs to adopt our budget. It's the very last day that our board can adopt the budget and still meet the timelines for notifying the community. As soon as the Board of Education adopts the budget, we will send out our budget newsletter that has all of the information on it. So that's the presentation to the board um, for our second budget draft. And this is normally, and I'm gonna assume this is the case, Mr. Fuchs, we're gonna open it up for any community questions. So if you have a question, we'd ask that you come to the mic because you're on TV and we need to get your voice. Uh, and we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions? Okay, great. That concludes the budget presentation. Or any questions by the board? Okay. Um, just one, I think we've talked about it before, but just to emphasize um, on the bus costs, um, you see, you know, close to a million dollars, but it's 70% is our aid ratio, so 70% comes back to us. Yes, we're getting uh, basically 70% back from New York State. It's one of the good things that New York State has kept with their aid fluctuation is they've kept the transportation aid very low. And that certainly helps us quite a bit. Thank you. And then once time that comes off and then it comes out so Yes, the idea would be to maintain um, that level, just like if you're uh, making a car payment in essence, you know, keeping 100 buses over a approximate 12 year span in good shape, safe, and uh, reliable means that um, uh, yearly So that concludes the report, Mr. President. No other questions? Give the community one last chance for questions. recommendation was to maintain your fleet and you're doing a good job um, uh, with respect to uh, all surrounding communities with uh, the buses so we thought we would keep that uh, another thing that has been happening with some of the local districts that have outsourced is they become they're at the will of the contractors and some districts have had um, high team uh, 15 16 one had over a 20% increase because the competition to outsource isn't there. If there were five, six, seven, eight, nine companies out there that could do it, competition might be high. Right now the competition is very low and you're pretty much, uh, again, uh, at, the, at the limb of, of the contractor. So we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, we're, we're constantly watching all of our bus routes and uh, the GPS system certainly helps. We're combining routes in the north and east of the district where it's a little more rural all the time. No? No other comments? No other questions? Do we have a motion to adjourn? Nope. Okay.
motion to adjourn? Second. Second. Thank you.